This is the editing room of a scholar, a professor of philosophy. His name is Houston Smith. For six months, Dr. Smith has been doing research on a special project and recording his findings on film. His purpose has been more than usually serious and profound. He's made an attempt to discover America's own moral answers to 16 of the most basic public and private issues that Americans face. In his search, Dr. Smith has traveled thousands of miles and asked literally hundreds of questions. He's talked with scholars and statesmen, newspaper editors and economists, philosophers and politicians. Tonight, from these priceless film records of that journey, Dr. Smith has drawn together what he believes are America's best answers to another basic problem of our future. Tonight on The Search for America. I'm Houston Smith. The object of our search tonight is America's foreign policy. The question, what are or should be the basic objectives which determine America's actions in the world? For me, tonight's search began about a year ago when I was interviewing a career diplomat in Washington as he had said that he would welcome questions on any aspect of our foreign policy, I thought I would begin with what seemed to me to be a routine opener. What I asked him did he think were the ultimate goals that we were trying to achieve through our foreign policy. To my surprise, he became dead quiet. When he did speak, he said, I take that back. Ask me anything you want except that question. I determined, therefore, that when I began this search, I was going to press through with just this question. What is it, ultimately, that we're trying to realize through our diplomacy? Interestingly enough, the first person I wanted to put this question to was a woman. Despite her age, or perhaps because of it, Eleanor Roosevelt seemed to me to be one person who had retained her vision of America's purpose in the world. And so I made my way to her small duplex apartment on East 62nd Street in New York City. She was having breakfast when we arrived, after which we went into the living room. Mrs. Roosevelt, does a nation need to have its foreign policy objectives clearly and consciously in mind? Or is it possible for it to do fairly well operating on an intuitive and pragmatic basis? If we are going to need the free world, must realize that we have to have some objectives for that free world to obtain, or we will not win to our uh, free ideas. Uh, the peoples who are not as yet convinced whether uh, our ideas are as good as communist ideas or not. Uh, that is at present the real struggle that lies between the nations of the world. The communists say, uh, we want a communist world. And whether it takes us 50 years or 100 years, we're sure that that is the law of the future. At least that is the way Mr. Khrushchev puts it. Now, we, I think, will have to put our objectives clearly to what are our objectives. They are freedom for people to uh, have an opportunity to earn a decent living. They are freedom for people to think as they choose and express themselves freely and come together uh, to discuss their ideas and to come to conclusions on them. 
Yes, we sir. believe in freedom for the individual to worship as he believes. Uh, if uh, his choice is uh, not to worship, we believe he has that right. As I was listening to you describe the uh, objectives of our foreign policy, I was reminded of Khrushchev's recent statement, I believe, that the objective of the Soviet policy was to raise the standard of living throughout the world to American levels. Uh, is this also our policy? I think without question it will have to be our policy. But I think that in the Soviet Union there is a genuine interest in material needs. Um, the emphasis is largely on that because they are in the stage of development when those are uppermost in their minds because they've never been met. Uh, we have gone a little beyond that. We know that man does not live by bread alone. The Soviets are still in the stage of development where, when I say bread, I speak of it yes, symbolically, um, where still the, the material needs of life, which have never been met, are uppermost and, and have to be met first because a man who is hungry uh, somehow cannot quite give himself to the things of the spirit. All of us, I think, feel, uh, who have experienced freedom, for instance, of choice and of, of um, opportunity to create uh, for ourselves what we want, um, that that's a precious thing and we want to preserve it. And we, we feel that it's not understood in a government such as a communist government, or a, even, they tell you in the Soviet Union, they don't have real communism. But whatever it is, it is not as yet understood how precious freedom could be, because they've never had it. Yes. Are there any specific steps that you feel that our country should be taking now towards realizing these. What about uh, sovereignty? Should we stand prepared to relinquish some of this if uh, participation in the United Nations requires? At present, I've seen very few signs that any nation wants to relinquish much more of its sovereignty than it did in signing the Charter when it agreed that before it used force, it would uh, submit the problem to the United Nations and try to settle it around a table. Well, can we hope for international order unless the nations are willing to go beyond this? I think that will come gradually, but I think we might begin to develop the world court um, and use it more. See, we in our country a, um, were not willing to accept compulsory submission, but if what we are aiming for, and I think it is true, that we are aiming for a world in which law is the um, prevailing force rather than war, uh, then I think we have to strengthen the mediums through which we use the law. And at present, the International Court of Justice is the first step uh, towards strengthening a system of law for the world. As I listen to you, why I don't hear you calling for any real self-sacrifice on the part of our nation. Does this mean that you think that uh, nations simply are incapable of this, or is it unneeded because uh, we face a situation in which self-interest and idealism genuinely merge? Well, nations are quite capable of sacrifice when they are convinced that it is necessary. Um, and if the time or Now, is need this sacrifice arises, for their own future, or is it sacrifice for other peoples? I think usually it has some element. Uh, usually you have to have some element uh, in it of self-interest. Uh, it is rare that you will get a nation as a whole to sacrifice unless it feels that it is necessary for
its own well-being to some extent. I do think you can appeal, but for this you usually have to have leadership to the humanitarian and uh, desire to help other peoples. Uh, for instance, the Queen of Holland has been able to appeal to her people to help refugees. I don't know whether many people now would remember Mr. Hoover's appeal to this country uh, way back in World War I uh, for wheat to be used in areas of the world where people knew how to use wheat and did not know how to use cornmeal. And in every household in this country, cornbread became the bread that was to be eaten at least two or three days a week in contrast to our use of wheat bread. And it was done in this country, to be sure it was wartime. People were geared to sacrifice. But I think you could, uh, given the same leadership, um, make people understand the need to, to give something of that kind of interest in other people in peacetime. Um, but it requires leadership, and it requires using your, your now very large uh, powers of communication to reach people, to make them understand. That's a very impressive example. Well, would UNRWA be another one in your mind? Would what? UNRWA, the United Nations. UNRWA Nation. would be another one. Yes. To a very Yes. much more recent one that more people would know about. Yes. But actually, um, UNRWA was an extraordinary uh, feat of, of asking people who were already uh, being asked uh, because of the war to meet uh, many hardships. Uh, but of course, in war, uh, everybody is conscious of the supreme sacrifice of life. And therefore, the other sacrifices seem less important. In peacetime, uh, you do not have that understanding uh, of the sacrifice of human life, do you see? It, it, yes. doesn't, uh, it doesn't enter into the sacrifice. You have to do it more altruistically, simply because you understand that other people are suffering and will need something that you have uh, and that you can can actually do without uh, in order to eventually be better off just as you will eventually be better off but that requires more leadership do you see much idealism around today in our foreign policy i'm thinking of uh, the first world war well not personally but we all know the slogans which were prevalent then, the war to end war, the war to make the world safe for democracy. And similarly, in World War II, we had the Atlantic Charter, the Four Freedoms, the Century of the Common Man. Somehow, I don't seem to be hearing uh, similar voices of idealism today. Do you? At the moment, uh, there is much less. There is much less ability to put it into words in high places. I've no doubt it exists, but it's not put into the ringing phrases uh, that we were fortunate to have it put into. Is it possible that our greatest failure in foreign policy may have been our inability to encourage genuine democracies in our immediate neighbors? I'm thinking of the Dominican Republic and Cuba and other South American dictatorships. Well, I, I think probably our greatest failure in foreign policy has been a lack of imagination which made us able to forestall certain situations. We, we uh, have allowed crises to occur, and then we have met them. But actually, the statesmanship required was to prevent crises. And... Um, I, I think that perhaps it's just a lack of imagination mm -hmm. and uh, an understanding through imagination of what situations were in the rest of the world. 
There was another person I wanted to see, Harold Stassen, a man who had just left an important post with government to run for political office. And so I drove to Philadelphia. And there, a few blocks from Independence Hall in a suite of rooms at the Ben Franklin Hotel, Harold Stassen interrupted his campaign to answer my questions. Mr. Stassen, some time ago you gave a speech titled The Mission of America. What do you think America's mission in the world is? Well, Mr. Smith, I have a deep conviction that America, under God, uh, does have the mission and should have the objective of uh, making this world a better place for people to live in. In other words, a very broad objective, a mission to contribute toward uh, peace for ourselves and for others, uh, a mission to uh, help in the freedom and respect for the dignity of men, not only in America, but on a worldwide basis. I think in terms of America as having a very broad mission. Well, when you speak of the mission of America, does this envision something like an American century? No, I would not describe it uh, as such. I, mean, I do not think in terms of America taking uh, as a dominant role, but rather of America stimulating nations in their own uh, freedom and independence and sovereignty to come forward in a way that advances the standard of living of their people, that expands their freedom, and that contributes to a worldwide peaceful scene uh, in uh, this space atomic age. Do you think that in point of fact we have been acting on certain objectives other than the ones that you describe? I'm thinking of uh, such objectives as communist containment or the preservation of American security and prosperity. Do you think that these objectives are adequate for our foreign policy? Well, we have tended, I would say, to, to we say aim too low or to have uh, aims that are uh, more limited and are, are not really uh, adequate uh, for the objective of a great nation founded as we are in the uh, concepts of the teachings of our great religions. Let me put it this way. I think that Toynbee's uh, studies of the rise and fall of civilizations are full of incidents of, uh, and experiences of nations that tried to follow a selfish interest or a self-interest or a foreign policy that devoted as they would say, to their own national interest, and that uh, these civilizations and nations have fallen and faded uh, through the centuries. I feel that just as there was a great difference in the concept of the founding of America in its relation to individual citizens and their rights, their freedoms, uh, their opportunities under God, so that this nation in uh, this world should have an aim in its foreign policy that's broader, that's higher, that's more encompassing for all civilization than we have had. Let me ask now what practical steps you think that we ought to be taking to live up to this world mission that you describe. Well, of course, the first thing would be to really express our mission in these terms. That is to, to work with other peoples and leaders of other peoples on what might be their mutual interest in the both the advance of civilization and in the uh, safeguarding of security and in the prospects for peace in the space atomic age. And then in the, some of the concrete ways, uh, America should take a lead constantly in the United Nations toward finding the mutual interests of peoples that are consistent uh, with peace. Uh, take initiatives and have them very broad gauged initiatives. Uh, we should uh, be in favor of uh, meetings of responsible heads of governments frequently to talk across the table of the most difficult problems. Not with an idea that any one conference would uh, easily solve these complex, deep problems, but rather that uh, the nature of the power of force in the modern world is such that we should be having the most responsible top leaders constantly analyzing the way in which differences 
might be resolved and then uh, take a lead in the economic advance and technical cultural advance of other peoples the technical assistance programs under the United Nations, the sister-to-sister -sister relationship of great educational institutions around the world, and the participation in the uh, cultural studies, cultural participation, a broader approach to other peoples. I take it from what you're saying that there isn't a great deal of idealism or imagination in American foreign policy today or at least that there isn't as much as there ought to. Well, there are, there are flashes of it and significant instances of it. I feel there needs to be more. Uh, the Marshall Plan had a, a wonderful uh, lift to it and uh, was tremendous. President Eisenhower's Adams for Peace program was uh, far-reaching and it was of this kind of, of imaginative and uh, broad uh, concept. But we tend constantly to get driven back to thinking that on a narrow national basis and a short-term approach, everything has to be justified. I feel that uh, the mission of America or a foreign policy adequate to America uh, must have a higher objective than this if it's to be true to our own deepest traditions and to the concepts of our religions. If we make the welfare of all peoples our concern, does this mean that we may have to try to enter into and influence the domestic policies of other countries? Well, it depends on what you mean by the word interfere. That tends to take on a specific uh, diplomatic uh, meaning. Well, let's I, say influence. Let me, oh, see, uh, this kind of leadership that I speak of would have an influence inside every country. In fact, with the communications of the modern world, it is inevitable that what America does and influences the internal affairs of other countries. And that's why it's so important that it be a constructive approach. We must not ignore the way in which other peoples develop their own governments. Now that's different from specifically interfering or reaching in to the internal domestic affairs in a sense of uh, of uh, political infiltration or uh, uh, steps of that kind. Uh, that would be unfortunate, would be wrong. But to encourage those in these other nations through the broad discussions worldwide and through the type of action we take worldwide to come forward and to move their own countries toward greater freedom and respect for human rights, that we should do. Mr. Stassen, what do you think it would cost us to live up to our world responsibilities? Well, the costs are substantial, that is, the amounts that need to be directly devoted to such a program. But in a net sense, I'm convinced that the costs will be less than the other kind of a policy. Let me put it this way, when we did not help other nations and were isolationism, isolationist in our approach after World War I, we had our deepest depression in history and we slid into World War II. So that I'm convinced that by following these kinds of policies and the real high aim of a mission of America, we can reach the point where there can be somewhat less devoted to armaments, even as there's more devoted to the world developments of standards of living and of culture and of education. And that in the uh, high employment our objective here in the process should be full employment without discrimination and without socialism. And these policies can fit together so that actually the cost net to the American people, I think, would be less in such a policy. There was much of idealism in the founding of America. I want to emphasize that again. And the reason that America's had this tremendous success under God is that that idealism was there and then the practical realism of the way to put it into force was applied. Things aren't always as bad as they seem. Sometimes they're worse. This may be true of America's place in the world today. Whether it is or not, 
these conversations have certainly helped me to see what we ought to be doing with every ounce of our nation's energy. We ought to be building a peaceful world of free and prospering democracies. The key words in this sentence are heard so often these days that it's difficult to give resonance to them. But they seem to me so important that I want to repeat them. First, we need a peaceful world with bombs around today that can kill cities like bullets kill individuals, it's an insult to the public intelligence to labor the need for peace. We've simply got to do more than any nation has ever done in the past to try to bring these death heads under control. James Thurber has a couplet for the atomic age. If you behave as humans do, it will be the end of you. If nations do more, no more than they have in the past, to bring war under control, this may be true. But in addition to peace, we need other things too. We need a world of free and prospering states, if for no other reason than because peoples today who are deprived of their liberty or their chance at the things of life are potential tinderboxes. We may have to wait a while for a democratic world but certainly we should be doing everything we can in this direction as well. If I'm worried tonight, it's not because I think this aim is either wrong or unclear, but because I fear that we may not appreciate or rise to what it requires of us. Because if we were to accept seriously the aim that has emerged in this half hour, our foreign policy would cease to become ceased to be, as it's been in the past, primarily defensive, a shield for our security, and would become instead a channel through which we would pour our energies to remaking the world. For a number of years, Russia has conceived her destiny in world proportions, to make a world of communism. We, by contrast, have conceived our destiny more parochially, We've sought to build here, in this sweet land, the heart's desire. To expand this American dream to world proportions, not in the sense of telling others how they must live, but in the sense of trying to help them achieve their liberty and fulfillment, this is a staggering assignment. It will take money, but more. It will take will and imagination and largeness of heart. President Roosevelt once said that our nation had a rendezvous with destiny. I can only hope that we will keep it. This is National Educational Television.